Ralph wanted to give the talk so bad, I said, just fine. fine with me. <laughs> Go ahead, Ralph. Okay, so nanomedicine. Myself and Rob Freitas, we've been working on this for some time. We're with the Institute for Molecular Manufacturing. So let's see if I've got the slide correct. Uh, before I start, for those of you who want to find out more about what we're talking about, we have two URLs. One is molecularassembler.com slash nanofactory. And that describes the collaboration that Rob and I are pursuing to develop uh, molecular manufacturing. And we also have a nanomedicine website, and that describes nanomedicine, in particular Rob's book on nanomedicine. And the goal that we are pursuing is very simple. We want to build a nanofactory, and we want to use the nanofactory to make medical nanorobots that can keep us alive and healthy. That's the purpose. So let me provide some context. The world around us is made of atoms. The projector, the screen, the building, also you and I. And what we're talking about is the relationship between things that we care about, health, wealth, and atoms, and the arrangement of atoms. It makes a great deal of difference how atoms are arranged. If you take the atoms in coal and rearrange them, you get diamond. If you take the atoms in sand and add a pinch of impurities, you get computer chips. And finally, the difference between good health and bad health is how your atoms are arranged. So that's the core concept. And the second core concept is that we as human beings have been building things, manufacturing things for countless millennia. And we do it by holding and assembling parts using positional capabilities, positional control. We have hands. And we can use those hands to build a huge range of products. Today, it is very difficult to build things to molecular level because we don't have molecular hands. Well, that's changing. This is some recent research. Actually, this was research done by uh, Kustansa's group in Japan. And that group actually won the 2009 Experimental Feynman Prize, which went to uh, Sugimoto, Abe, and Kustansa. And the work was for, well, you can see the picture. They were able to take individual silicon atoms on a uh, silicon surface, which had been coated with tin, and they were able to spell out SI, which is seen in the lower right-hand frame there. So they were able to arrange the silicon atoms on the silicon excuse me, on the tin-coated silicon surface in a very precise pattern. And they did this at room temperature, which is rather dramatic. Most of the previous work, most of the previous things you've seen where there's you know, a corporate logo or whatever, were done at very, very low temperatures in order to provide stability. This is done at room temperature, and they're actually making and breaking bonds in the process of building these structures. So for this work, they received the 2009 Feynman Prize and I should also mention that the prize in theory for 2009 went to Rob. So I think he did a wonderful job in, <laughs> congratulations, in doing not only theoretical work related to this, we have a paper on the theoretical aspects of mechanosynthesis or arranging atoms using molecular tools, uh, but also in a whole range of other areas which I think you're all familiar with in nanomedicine and in kinematic self-replicating machines and others. Okay, so that's experimental. So the concept is, gosh, if we had molecular tools, then we should be able to build molecular structures, complex molecular structures. What do these molecular tools look like? 
Well, here are some examples. These are specific structures. And you have to imagine that there is some larger extension. So you have the Empire State Building here, and it's coming down to this teeny little tip, which has a very specific structure. So we wave the Empire State Building around and perform operations on various structures. But as you can see, there, there are a range of tools. I won't go into their specific functions. Suffice to say that we've done theoretical analysis using standard computational chemistry software, which shows that, yeah, these tools should work. You can use this tool set to build another self-same tool set. You can use the tools in this tool set to recharge themselves. And you can use the tools in the tool set to build other useful molecular structures and molecular machines. For example, you could be able to build a hydrocarbon bearing. This is a, a, a bearing, a molecular bearing. It's, again, theoretical. But if you could build it, it should work as advertised. There's been some analysis on this kind of thing. It's fairly simple. It's simply a flat sheet of diamond bent into a tube. And that's stuck into another flat sheet of diamond bent into a bigger tube. So there is a shaft and a sleeve. And it looks as though it should rotate quite easily. Um, so there, there are various things you can build. This is an example of something you would build with hydrocarbons. Another something that you could build with hydrocarbons would be something much larger, a robotic arm. If I'm talking about using molecular tools to build molecular structures, then it would be useful if I had a molecular structure which could hold the molecular tools to build more molecular structures. And if you look in the lower right, you'll see that tiny little bearing, which is right there. And that's the bearing from the previous slide. So this is a robotic arm. It has some millions of atoms. We have not done a detailed analysis showing where every atom is located in this design. But it should be feasible in principle. And in practice, when we get to the point where we need that, I would expect that we could design it without too much difficulty. So that provides the background before we go into nanomedicine. Now, one of the core observations here is that disease and ill health are caused largely by damage at the molecular and the cellular level, very fine scale. But today's surgical tools are huge and imprecise in comparison. In the future, we'll have fleets of surgical tools that are molecular, both in size and precision. We'll also have computers much smaller than a single cell to guide those tools. So we're going to see dramatic advances. For example, that robotic arm I showed you in the scale of things looks like it's very small compared to the mitochondrion. And not much larger would give you an 8-bit computer. So these devices are small and could deal directly with molecular structures. We have here a, quote, typical cell, unquote, if I can use such a term. Our robotic arm has vanished into a dot. We see the mitochondria inside the cell. They are now relatively small. We have structures like a respirocyte, which I'll get to in a moment, or a microbivore, which are also relatively small compared with the cell. So we could quite literally have hundreds of thousands of molecular robotic arms inside that cell doing whatever it is they do. And the cell would hardly notice. So that gives you a feeling for the size of the devices we're talking about. 